So we're going to first begin with the problem with traditional silicon solar cells. So as you may all know, they're heavy, they're expensive, they don't necessarily look that great, and they're in, uh, primarily in industrial applications, and they also require direct sunlight to function. What's revolutionary about dye solar cells instead is actually that they're low cost, they're aesthetically pleasing, as you can see in that picture, and they actually can even work indoors in lighting like this. Um, the overall objective of our study was to study dye sensitized solar cells from a technical and business perspective. In terms of the technical objective, we wanted to fabricate our own working cells, and we also wanted to work on improving cell efficiency. Um, from a business perspective, we wanted to understand the commercialization potential of the technology and also understand what target consumer segments would be best suited for this technology. So roadmap for today, we're going to begin with the background and then the fabrication procedure and then we're going to move on to the live demonstration and then my partner Andy is going to move on to research components one, two, and three which are based on how to improve efficiency and then research component four which is commercialization and then finally a conclusion. So how exactly does a dye solar cell function? So what happens is that photons of light hit the dye, the electron is excited within the dye which then gets transferred to the TiO2 conduction band which moves to the anode finally. So once the electron finally leaves the dye, it leaves behind a positive charge which the iodide capitalizes on and actually transfers to the cathode using a redox reaction. So I know that was a lot of information, so basically all you need to know is that light comes in, the electron moves one way and the positive charge moves the other way, completely the circuit. Performance metrics. Solar cell efficiency is really important and it's based on four different factors. Current, voltage, fill factor and incident power. So as you can see, that's an IV curve. You have um, current on one axis and voltage on the other. And the most important part of the efficiency calculation is most definitely the fill factor, which is basically the ratio of the purple box to the red box. The closer that ratio is to one, meaning the closer the two areas are to each other, the better the cell. Moving on to the fabrication procedure. The first step was to actually deposit a layer of TiO2 on the slide. We then impregnated those slides with warm dye overnight and then we fill the cell with electrolyte, and finally we sealed it off to basically capture that electrolyte within the cell. As you can see on the left side, we then chose four of our best cells and connected them in series, and we were actually able to generate 1.8 volts with four cells, and in fact as high as 2.4 volts with five cells. And we were able to power a red LED, and the most important fact the most important factor here is that not just that we were able to factor, not just that we were able to light up the LED, but also that the fact that we were able to have this function within um, an indoor setting with no direct sunlight. So I know I ran over the fabrication, but I think what's really important to understand is that it was actually the bulk of our project. We spent about three to four months uh, mastering the fabrication process and we ran into a lot of roadblocks. The two biggest problems we had were, one, the electrolyte, so what would happen is once we actually filled the cell with an electrolyte, it would actually evaporate the next day. So we, you know, th there was a lot of trial and error in terms of finding the best sealing technique to actually, to actually enclose the, the electrolyte within the cell. The second biggest problem we had was the titanium deposition. So sometimes when we would deposit the titanium, it would actually chip. And obviously that has problems in terms of conduction. So overall we had a 50% success rate with our, with our cells. So we're gonna move on with our Live demonstration, and my partner Andy is going to demonstrate our five cells, which are now connected in series. Um, as you can see, they are transparent, and um, they're also <laughs> they're also relatively uh, more aesthetically pleasing compared to silicon solar cells. And we're actually going to power this up right now for you. Um, <coughs> after we were able to fabricate a working cell in our lab, the next thing we wanted to do was understand how we can improve the efficiency of our cell. Now, let's go back to the diagram that you guys saw just a couple of minutes ago of how the cell works. The titanium dioxide is a really important component of this cell. It's the little bubbles that you see that are outlined by the blue box. Now, the TiO2 actually governs the speed at which electrons diffuse from the dye to the electrode. Now, the takeaway from this is that the faster and more efficient the diffusion process, the better the cell works. Now, on the right-hand side, we have nanostructure of TiO2. The important thing here is that you see that it's very porous. In fact, when this is in contact with the dye, you have a maximal surface area between the dye and the TiO2. This actually maximizes the electron transfer and the diffusion, which improves the efficiency of the cell. Now let's take a look at the different TiO2 that we looked at. 
Now, TiO2 exists in a range of morphologies. And morphologies mean that it's the same material, but it's in different crystal structures. Now, we used anatase, brookite, and P25. And they're from left to right in increasing nanostructure size. The important thing to see here is that as you increase the size of the nanostructure, it actually begins to interfere with optical light, which means that the one on the right is really opaque, whereas the one on the left is really transparent. Now, let's take a look at the results. We found that the anatase, which was organically grown in our lab, actually outperformed the conventionally used P25 significantly. This was a really interesting finding because this is something that we did in our lab, and we're kind of comparing it to the industry standard. So after we found that anatase was our best TiO2 morphology, we wanted to better understand anatase. So the first thing we did was we decided to vary the lengths of the anatase nanorods. As you see here on the left, we have 8 nanometer nanorods. And on the right, we have 60 nanometer nanorods. Um, that's a math flaw. And so the results are the following. It actually turns out that the shorter nanorods perform significantly better. And we feel that this is due to the fact that there's increased surface area and more contact between the dye and the TiO2, as we mentioned earlier. Now, after we were able to improve the anatase, we also want to improve how we can fabricate it differently to improve the cell. Now, the following, we did the following. First, because anatase is grown in organic solution, a lot of oleic acid is a byproduct of the synthesis, which attaches onto the anatase after the synthesis. Here's the chemical structure on the left-hand side. We feel that the amount of oleic acid could possibly affect the porosity of the anatase, which, as I mentioned earlier, could possibly increase the uh, contact surface area. On the right-hand side, we see a UV, UV ozone cleaning machine. Because there are a lot of impurities from an organic synthesis process, we feel that by applying a UV ozone cleaning treatment, this could actually remove a lot of the impurities. Now let's look at the results. By increasing the solubility, which means increasing the amount of oleic acid on the anatase, we're able to improve the cell efficiency by 15%. On the right-hand side, we're able to improve the cell efficiency by 32% by applying UV and ozone treatment. Now let's move on to the last part of increasing efficiency. By changing the thickness of the cells and the resistance of the cells, we're actually able to make the cell do perform a lot better. We compared thick 8 ohm resistance cells, and we compared that to thinner 15 ohm resistance cells. Now, we, we got what we expected. The less resistant cells performed better. Now, let's move on to the exciting part, the commercialization potential. So I'm going to go back to what Tommy mentioned in the beginning, the three cool things or exciting things about disensitized solar cells. They're low cost. They're aesthetically beautiful, as you can see here. And they work indoors, as we just demonstrated just a couple of minutes ago, without any sunlight at all. So let's think of a situation. Let's say you have a layover at JFK, and it's 2 in the morning. You, just, you forgot to charge your phone for the day, or you need to charge it. And you're running from gate to gate. You don't have time to sit down next to an outlet, outlet. Now, if you had just a regular silicon solar cell, well, you're out of luck because the sun's on the other side of the world. It's 2 AM. But if you had a disensitized solar cell, you can be charging your phone as you walk by drawing power from the fluorescent lights in the airport. That is really exciting. So the first application we feel would be great is handbags and dye solar handbags that you can carry with you. Now let's say you want to decorate your home and you want to be technologically savvy, but you also want to make it look cool. So one thing that we propose is that we can actually have really cool looking flowers and other home decor that you can brag, about your, brag to your friends about that's really technologically savvy and also looks great. Now finally, let's say you're designing your home and you want to add some sunlight to your house. You also want to harvest some of the sunlight that you're adding to your house. So what can you do? You can use disensitized solar cells for skylights and for windows, as you can see on the right hand side, to harvest the light while increasing the, uh, the, uh, the, the energy savings of your home. Now, moving on to the driving forces and the restraining forces. We feel in this, for this technology, the driving forces are that it's really cheap, it saves you a lot of money, it reduces the carbon footprint, and because there's so much buzz about charging your iPods, charging your iPhones, we feel that it's a rapidly growing segment that has not been targeted by solar cell technology yet. However, some restraining forces. We feel that the industry is currently semi-entrenched in silicon solar cells. In fact, the industry has already invested a lot in bulk silicon solar cells for industrial power. 
We also feel that because there is a liquid component in the, in the solar cell, this could, uh, this could pose safety hazards if, this, if the dye were to leak or if they were to break. However, despite these concerns, we feel that there's a great potential for dye synthesized solar cells. Based on our research and some other research, we believe that the market will reach 470 million by the year 2015. The two main takeaways from the commercialization feature is that this is a consumer targeted technology. In addition, it's for small scale applications. We're not talking about powering cities. We're not talking about you know, finding the next replacement for coal. We're talking about charging your phone when you need it, when the sun's not out. So let's look at, let's kind of do a recap of what we talked about today. We fabricated a working cell. We found that anatase was the best TiO2 component. We found that shorter nanorods perform far better than longer nanorods. We found that by uh, increasing the solubility and applying a UV ozone treatment, we we're able to improve the efficiency of the cell by 15 and 32% respectively. We found that the thicker, lower resistance cells perform better. And most importantly, we feel that Dyson synthetized solar cells technology will, universalize, will universally change the, uh, the solar cell landscape going forward in the next five or 10 years. With that, we'd like to thank Professor Murray, Tom, Duncan Co. for their help, and we'd like to open up the floor to any questions.